have a curated selection of TED-style talks from eminent space scientists. I'm really excited about this next bit. Uh, we're going to start with the founder and chief scientist of Privateer. It's machine-based detection, tracking, and monitoring of satellite operators in orbital space, no less. Please give a lovely ITU AI for Good Summit welcome to Mariba Ja. Hello, hello, check. All right, how's everybody doing? Woohoo! What? Wow. All right. So, uh, in any case, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here. I think first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the indigenous people of the world, the original stewards of Spaceship Earth. So, I very much want to uh, send that acknowledgement. And in that spirit, I'd like to ask permissions to these ancestors of ours who were taking care of the planet for so long and are uh, finding themselves decimated today. And so with that, I invoke their permissions from the north, from the west, from the south, from the east, above, Father Sky, below, Mother Earth, and the divine spark within each of us within. So I begin with that. So one of the things that we have forgotten is we have forgotten our intergenerational contract of stewardship with the planet. We are behaving in ways collectively that are resulting in our self-extinction because we believe ourselves to be independent of what's happening around the globe, what's happening to our neighbor. But really, all things are ultimately interconnected and if you believe in independence, is because you haven't looked far enough, you haven't looked long enough, and you haven't looked deep enough. But if you do those things, you will see that all these things are interconnected. Spaceship Earth, Gaia, is a system of systems. It's land, air, ocean, and space. Now, even though that we have been working collectively to our detriment, there are things that we can do to try to recover our planet. Most of all, we are at the mercy of the unintended consequences of our actions, but Mother Earth is giving us signals of these unintended consequences, and they're very, very apparent, and there's no escaping those things. But at the same time, one of the things that I'd like to say to everybody in the room is while all of us are distracted with what's going on here on the Earth's surface, what I want to do here in a, in a brief moment is be able to, let's see, zoom out uh, from the surface of the Earth and we're going to go up a few hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface and what we're witnessing is the detriment of our space environment as well. Right now, we are tracking over 50,000 objects ranging in size from your cell phone all the way to the space station in different orbits. And of those 50,000 objects, about 5,000 work and everything else is garbage. This is where we're heading. It doesn't quite look this bad today. This is clearly exaggerated, like a Wally -E situation, but we're headed there. So who cares? Well, the very technologies that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, position, navigation, timing, GPS, all these things, communications, all of these go through space-based platforms, these robots in the sky that we call satellites, and nothing is protecting these 5,000 satellites from getting schwacked, that's the technical term, from getting schwacked by a piece of junk and us losing these capabilities. The very things that connect us and make us a global society, everything from financial transactions, imagine going to the ATM, not being able to get a hold of your money, not being able to communicate with a loved one, so on and so forth, and we know more about the planet because of space than by any other source of information, okay? 
So we know more about humanity and the planet because of this. But it gets worse. Many of the things that we launch are coming back. These are all real. I'm telling you, folks, everything from the, from the size of cars to school buses are landing on the surface of the earth. None of this stuff is made up. And it's going to get worse. We're going to see this more frequently. This happens when we behave as if we were independent of the environment. This happens when we behave as if we were independent of each other, when we do not acknowledge that interconnectedness, when we do not embrace stewardship as a mechanism to have a successful conversation with our environment. This is the result of that. Now, even our skies are becoming less dark, less quiet, we see things reflecting more and more light towards the ground. But I guess a bit of good news is we still have pockets of people around the globe that fully believe in the interconnectedness of all things. These are our indigenous people. This is traditional ecological knowledge. This knowledge is captured by these folks and they practice it every day. Every day they understand that they're living in an existential crisis and the only way through it is to have a successful conversation in the environment. They have something to tell us and we should be listening to their voices. Even though many people in this room may have bachelor's degrees, master's, PhDs, I have a PhD. I didn't see any of these people in my classrooms but they have much more knowledge. They are true scientists and true engineers. What we need to do is we need to marry, we need to harmonize this traditional ecological knowledge or ancient tech with deep tech, high tech as, as we know it to really scale the ability for us to achieve sustainability on Earth. And it really means looking at Mother Earth as this integrated system of systems. Again, land, air, ocean, and space. We have lost contact with the sky. Most people don't even know what a dark sky looks like, okay, because we live in big cities, lots of lights, and I think that disconnection has basically uh, severed this umbilical cord to the sky, which is really our home, the stars. We actually need to go there. We need space exploration, because eventually, planet Earth, spaceship Earth, this pale blue dot in this solar system, well, uh, eventually everything in the solar system has an expiration date because the sun that is giving us life and warmth runs out of fuel one day, guaranteed. And when that happens, everything is basically lost. We need to be able to thrive, not around another planet, but around another star altogether. We need that, okay? So, um, I'm gonna give you some more good news here if I haven't given you, given you enough. So right here, I'm going to show you, I'm going to get a little bit nerdy here, and uh, I'm going to show you a few things. One, this is just looking at 4,000 of these anthropogenic or human-made objects in Earth orbit, in different orbits. This outer ring is called the, the geosynchronous ring because it takes satellites about 24 hours uh, to go around in their orbit once. The color code is dependent on their orbital inclination, meaning the plane in which they orbit how, it's, how that might be inclined with the equator, so something with a zero degree inclination is orbiting around Earth's equatorial plane. Things that are 90 degree inclination are orbiting around the poles. So there's a structure that you can kind of see here. We don't put things in random places, but what I want to show you is that um, there is no such thing as randomness, by the way. If any, any of you believes in randomness, we should have a conversation uh, later. Randomness, believing in randomness is basically saying no to learning. And I'm not, uh, I'm not um, particular on that. But in any case, if I compute the cross product of the position and velocity vectors of these 4,000 objects at that same time, I get this thing called specific orbital angular momentum space. Say it three times really quick and then nothing will happen actually. Um, but you know, this structure, these are, these are these highways in space. And you can see I haven't done anything. There's been no sort of clustering that I've done. These things are naturally aggregating in these highways in orbital energy space. Things here on the bottom are low Earth orbit, uh, which goes from 100 kilometers to about 1,000 kilometer altitude. This is mid Earth orbit, and then this is geo. So geo is about 36,000 kilometers uh, away from the Earth's surface, and then you can see that ring there. 
these highways are becoming more and more congested because the thing is we're not going to stop launching satellites, okay? And most of the stuff up there, uh, most of it just doesn't come back for centuries or even more. And um, some of it never comes back, actually. And when something stops working, it becomes debris, and we just keep on launching more and more stuff, put more and more stuff up there. So how busy is the stuff up there? Well, let me see if I can refresh this real quick. Of course, uh, internet and technology, as you know, it always works. While this does its thing, let's see how it populates. So what I want to show you is I want to show you how frequently are objects crisscrossing each other. Again, these are orbital highways in space. Um, there are no off-ramps, per se, and um, objects are crisscrossing each other, so you're seeing this populate. And I like doing real-time stuff, because this, this lets you know I'm not faking stuff. Like, we're just going to a website, we're doing things in reality. So this is predictions right now. This is 20 minutes. Over the next 20 minutes continuously, I ask myself, which pairs of objects do we predict will come within 10 kilometers of each other? And this is what you see behind me, okay? These are the crisscrossings within the next 20 minutes continuously. The green dots are pairs of objects that both of them are working. The red dots are both objects are dead. Yellow dots, one is dead and then one is working. And the relative speed in the histogram that you see there is 15 kilometers per second. These things are crisscrossing each other with relative speeds of 15 times the speed of a bullet. The smallest thing that we're tracking is a cell phone, which is many times the size of a bullet. So if a cell phone that's many times the size of a bullet is traveling 15 times the speed of a bullet with respect to a satellite, Let it, let's not even talk about what it could do to people. It's a bad day. That will not survive, okay? Then it becomes many, many more pieces that continue to pollute the space environment. All right, more good news for you because I can tell you want to hear it. Um, so one of the things that I did um, or that, that some, some people may know me for is this thing called Asher Graph, which I commercialize with this company, Privateer, that I co-founded with Alex Fielding and Steve Wozniak. You may have heard the guy, he co-founded Apple. And so, um, in any case, every single dot that you see here is a human-made object currently being tracked in Earth orbit. Um, let's see if I can add some rocket bodies and some debris here. Okay, so this is what things are kind of looking like. And let's see if we can uh, zoom in here a little bit. So, yeah, so you can kind of see these things moving around. Most of this stuff is junk. Pretty much only the things that are blue dots are things that are working, but everything else is garbage. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, of garbage in Earth orbit. And one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to monitor, we're trying to monitor and understand how people are behaving, uh, you know, in this space. You can see there's a lot of trash. The, si the, the, the dot, the size of the dot doesn't correspond to the size of the object. So it, you know, if, if you actually had to see, see this with your naked eyes, you probably wouldn't see any dots because they're so small. Uh, but there, it, it shows the location of all these things. So one of the things that I'm trying to do here, let's see if I can, yep, yeah, okay, here's some... So what I want to do is I want to show you a few things. One, let me try and see if I can refresh this thing. What could possibly go wrong? Um, yep, here we go. So here you can see better with the blue dots. Again, blue dots are things that are working. Everything else is garbage. This string of pearls that you see right here, anytime you see one of these things, this is Elon Musk's uh, Starlink satellites. So you can kind of see there. That's to provide you with global internet, of course. Um, so you can kind of see that, that train of stuff right now. Basically, Elon is launching 60 satellites every three weeks, and he plans to launch 10,000. Over half the working satellites in humanity belong to Elon Musk. So he, he owns about 3,000 of those 5,000 satellites, and he's, he, he's gonna launch about 10,000 10, of these. We have no traffic rules in space. What could go wrong with that, right? There's no coordination, no planning. We just do things because we believe uh, we can because it's legal to do so, um, not because it's necessarily environmentally friendly or anything like that. So uh, because we're here and this is like an ITU sort of thing, um, let me just see if I can bring up, uh, a, let's see. So I'm gonna bring up this object. 
this Nimic Q2. Um, let's see, and I'm going to see if I can bring up another object here. Let's go with Luke. Yep, we'll go with that, and we'll add that one to the list. And then we're going to go with an SJ17 Chinese satellite. There we go. And so what I want to do is, let's see, the object list, and I'm going to paint these orbits so that we can kind of see. Let's see that. Yep. Okay. Here we go. So these are three examples. These are things in this kind of geostationary uh, ring. This Nimit Q2 is a Canadian satellite which um, has been retired. If we can zoom in to that, and I'm going to get rid of the debris and the rocket bodies just to be able to see things a little bit more. So let's see, this Nimit Q2, yep, uh, if we zoom in even more, we can kind of see that that's over a longitude where Canada has access to that, so that makes that makes some sense. If we go around the belt here, and let's see, here's this uh, Luke Olymp, which is Russian. If we zoom into that, looks like that thing's over the Atlantic. Uh, doesn't seem to uh, correspond to anything like Russia could actually access uh, very easily in that location, okay? Um, and then if we go to this SJ-17, we can do that. If we zoom into that, well, that looks like it's definitely something that China has access to that. Okay, so that kind of makes some sense. So one of the things, right, with the ITU is uh, people get anything that's going to be transmitting kind of goes through the ITU, right, they get allocations, um, and their frequency allocations and their positional uh, allocations as well so that we can avoid things interfering uh, with each other from a radio frequency perspective. So if I look at those three satellites, and then I look at the SJ-17, and by the way, uh, all this work is from uh, Thomas Roberts, who's a PhD student at MIT. I'm on his PhD committee, and so uh, I'm leveraging his work and bringing that into Privateer. We're collaborating on this, but all these plots and things are from Thomas's work. Um, and he's here for the summer at EPFL, so he's probably in the room right now. Um, but anyway, with the SJ-17, just looking historically, uh, you know, for all these years, is like 2017 to like 2021 that you see here on the bottom, we can see that, you know, the excursions that SJ-17 made, um, much of the time were basically out of compliance with, uh, you know, the allocations, even, even, even the ones like where it stayed, it interestingly, the places where it parked itself, it parked itself in places where it was allowed, where it did have uh, allocations, um, but while it was going around and visiting different places in GEO, it was out of compliance. So compliance and, and being out of compliance isn't a static thing, it's a dynamic thing, right? Um, so this just gives an example of that. And uh, let's see here, and if we go to Luke, then we can kind of see something uh, very similar for Luke, except that um, most of the time it was non-compliant. It basically stayed over regions where uh, it didn't have the allocations. Russia didn't have any sort of uh, allocation for where the, the, the satellite was parked. And so this went around the, the geo belt, um, visiting different places for who knows what reasons. Uh, I don't speak to the Russians frequently about these things. Um, and then... Interestingly enough, this one Canadian uh, satellite was out of compliance most of the time as well, just did different excursions. This is the longitudes around the geo belt. So did different kind of excursions around the geo belt and mostly didn't stay anywhere close to where Canada has an allocation. Now, um, we can't, so there's a lot of data out there and machines are here to help us really understand how to uh, properly aggregate the data and find some insights. Humans are better at providing context. But what I'm saying, I guess, is that if we want the space environment and other environments uh, to really be pristine, as pristine as possible, and we want to achieve sustainability, three things really help us achieve those. Making the, the, the environment more predictable, making it transparent in terms of who's doing what to whom when, and developing a body of evidence that we can use to hold people accountable for that. So predictability, 
transparency and accountability is what we're after. So one of the things that we're doing is we're using machines to be able to autonomously go grab disparate source of data and information, aggregate these, and then with the machines comb through this heterogeneous multi-dimensional data set to help us understand how people are behaving, who's complying and who isn't, because monitoring these things is what gets us to being able to enforce something. You can't enforce something that you don't manage, you can't manage something that you don't know, and you can't know something that you don't measure. So it all comes down to measurements. But with that, um, I guess my, uh, my time with you is at an end, and I just wanted to say really quickly that one of the things that we do in order to get to this aggregation, right, is we have sources of information on the left, we have inquiry on the right, and we use a knowledge graph database to bring all these things in so that we could serve the widest uh, variety of inquiry. But with that, I wanted to say thank you very much and um, much love and aloha to each and every one of you. And look, technical problems are difficult. Political problems are Herculean. The biggest problem is the absence of empathy. And so I am here begging you, I, I'm here begging you to consider having empathy for these problems because otherwise we can't get there. And embrace stewardship. It's our only way to basically move forward with Spaceship Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you.